I'm here to uh, present my topic, a manual therapy and exercise approach to the management of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I'm an osteopathic manual practitioner and registered kinesiologist in Oakville. Uh, so I've worked in, in physiotherapy clinics and in private practice for over 20 years doing rehabilitative exercise type programs. And then eight years ago, I went back to become an osteopathic manual practitioner and graduated from the Canadian College of Osteopathy here in Toronto. Um, this is a manual-based practice. Traditional osteopathy is really how osteopathy began and how it's practiced essentially around the world. Um, the Canadian College of Osteopathy has been um, in Canada for 36 plus years. We have six campuses across the country, but we are a growing profession. No problem. So because I somehow managed to choose two professions that were both difficult to spell and <laughs> not well understood, I'm going to begin with some definitions. Oh, I have clicker now. Excellent. Supposedly, yes. Excellent. So kinesiology is the science of human movement. It incorporates both biomechanics and ergonomics for the diagnosis of movement disorders. Kinesiologists are exercise spe specialists in the prevention and management of illness, injury, and chronic conditions. Osteopathy is a natural form of medicine with precise and gentle palpation and techniques that works to identify the cause of dysfunction and to help restore health in the body. Osteopathy is based on the principle that the body <coughs> is a functional unit and that it has the ability to regulate itself when given the right environment. So just again to look at some of the EDS characteristics as it applies to what I do. It's a multi-system connective tissue disease with varied clinical presentations of structural dysfunction and associated neurovascular and autonomic disturbances throughout the body. Connective tissue invests in all structures in the human body, including the bones, muscles, organs, vessels, and nerves. And in the case of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, the connective structure has changed, therefore the body struggles to find balance and maintain function. So after taking a detailed history of the patient, my assessment includes uh, posture and gait evaluation, looking for compensatory postural and movement patterns. And I'm asking a variety of questions based on what I find. So what structures are being impacted based on the load through the body? What tissues are under too much load and which ones might not be uh, participating or helping the body? I'm looking at the evaluation of the structure. So where is it? How is it moving? What is its inherent motility? And this can apply to a joint or an organ or a different system. Um, from an osteopathic perspective, I'm always looking at the body to see what systems are being impacted. Is there a problem with pressure regulation? How does this um, compare to then some of the systemic symptoms that they're experiencing? Where do the lines of gravity fall? Um, how is their craniosacral system functioning, looking at visceral structures and fluid flow such as circulation of blood, lymphatics, cerebral spinal fluid. This is just a general sort of postural um, evaluation, just giving the center as the normal posture with the central line of gravity being represented down the center of the body. It shows a couple of different posture types, one being the anterior type on the right, the posterior type on the left. But as I look at different people and the, and their postural presentation, I can start to gain appreciation as to where some of the pressures are in the body, how um, their weight is being uh, bearing through different joints, and gives you an indication as to some areas that might be in dysfunction. So osteopathic treatment. Sometimes dif difficult to describe what we do, but the biggest thing that I think um, elicits to the process of diagnosis and treatment is we listen. We listen to what the body's saying under our hands, what the fascias, the joints, the fluids, and the viscera are telling us. Again, back to that concept of the position, the mobility, and the motility. We visualize the anatomy under our hands. If I had a book of anatomy with just cross sections, it would be perfect because as you lay your hands in different places, you're trying to think of the layers of the body underneath. 
So in this case, it's just an example of a cross-section through the cervical spine and some of the structures, whether it's bony, soft tissue, visceral, vascular, you're taking into all of those things in consideration at that location, but also regionally in the area and how those systems connect throughout the body. Um, again, I selected just a sample of some of the techniques that I use osteopathically. Um, they may not apply to everybody, but again, um, some common themes that I notice in the EDS population. So I'm treating horizontal structures a lot. The, treating the diaphragm, whether it's the thoracic diaphragm, pelvic diaphragm, thoracic inlet, uh, associated muscles and viscera, relative bony structures, things that can impact nerve conduction and fluid regulation. This helps to bring their body back into better alignment. Again, through the central light line of gravity, it helps with overall homeostasis. The craniosacral system, so looking at the attachments of the dura within the cranium through the upper cervical spine and its attachment down in the sacrum, looking for balancing dural tension, working on the cranial base, for instance, helps to restore autonomic balance and improves the body's homeostasis. I use another variety of gentle techniques to improve joint function and posture alignment, such as mild fascial inhibition, some visceral techniques, muscle energy, and strain counterstrain. So I've, I've chosen a couple of my EDS patients to help uh, present some of the things that I do. So here are Natalie and Karen, and they're twins, as you can tell. It didn't take me too long to figure out the differences between them, but um, they uh, were diagnosed about two and a half years ago with uh, EDS hypermobility type. And they were already being seen by a physiotherapist in the clinic, and that's how they came to me. Um, they have a long history of repetitive strains, fractures, um, even dislocations, and a lot of peripheral joints. Natalie on the left has a scoliosis, and Karen on the right, she suffers from migraines. So I do see them approximately every two to four weeks, depending on what's going on in their lives. So here, I am treating uh, Natalie. So on the left, I'm doing a technique to help balance her sacrum and her pelvis between the ilium. And on the right, I'm working on her thoracic diaphragm. So in the case of scoliosis, I'm wanting to make sure that her pelvis is well aligned just to help um, rebalance the muscles and the structures as they support the spine. Uh, here on the left, I'm balancing the cranial base, the tentorium cerebelli with a thoracic diaphragm, uh, helping again with alignment. And on the right, doing a gentle um, pumping technique to help release QL. So just a sample of some of the things that I might do with her on a given day. Now we're moving on to Karen. And because her symptoms are a lot through the, um, the head with respects to migraines, I do work at the cranial base, the picture on the left, um, the occipital fossa, and then on the right, um, some gentle myofascial work through the upper cervical spine. They don't have any other systemic symptoms, uh, these girls. Um, so really looking at a lot of joint issues in particular. With Karen, I work on her upper thoracic spine too, making sure that that's moving well. The issue with a lot of kids for sure today is the time spent on their electronic devices, how much time they're spending, um, head down. So there's a lot of education that I do. And um, especially with you know young active kids, started starting to get them aware of their body, understanding when they're getting some signals in terms of how their neck is feeling or the headaches that they have to be reflective as to what they're doing in terms of their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, so the next two techniques, I'm balancing the straight sinus in the center there, and then I do work intraorally to help release tension behind the eyes as well. And so now my next patient, Rachel. So I've known Rachel and her family for over 10 years. So I've known Rachel long before her first symptoms of EDS. Um, at the time when she was younger, she might come to see me occasionally. She was very active in dance. She might have um, you know, some little things going on due to her activity level. Uh, she was diagnosed, well, within the last four years, but some of her initial symptoms started about four and a half years ago with dysautonomia. And so Rachel is a full-time high school student working very hard. She does very well. And she comes to me right now, weekly or bi-weekly, really to help her manage all the time spent doing um, homework 
and sitting. So again, it, what I do with each patient obviously just depends on what they're presenting with at that time. So just helping them to problem solve and deal with things that are ongoing. So here on the left, I'm working on Rachel's clavicle. She's having some issues with her shoulders, really largely associated with sleep and sleep positions. I'm um, working on her wrist here as well, balancing the carpal tunnel, helping with um, the carpal bones. And on the left, uh, working on her foot. So Rachel does use orthotics, but still from time to time, she has issues with the um, uh, arch and the alignment of her arch. A lot of the, with all of the techniques that I do with some of the more hypermobile EDS, it's always working in compression. So I'm not stretching, but I'm really compressing to help with that neuromuscular um, connection there. In the picture on the right, I'm balancing her small intestine with her lumbar spine. So working in the cervical spine again in compression, which helps relieve some of the fascial tension through the neck. And on the right, balancing the anterior cervical fascia and the hyoid bone. So moving on to exercise. Some of the ultimate goals with the exercise is to retrain the neuromuscular system for optimal joint position, stabilization, and motion. Uh, my goal is to improve proprioception and kinesthetic awareness, improve posture, breathing mechanics, and their gait. Some of the types of functional exercise that I use are Pilates-based, another system called the dynamic neuromuscular stabilization that's out of the Prague School of Rehabilitation, uh, pool therapy, and then a home program. The therapeutic exercise, DNS, has been around for quite a long time, um, out of, again, d through physiotherapists in, um, in Prague. It focuses on breath retraining. So that's another big factor, is how people are breathing. A lot of the associated musculature in the neck gets overused, so I, I do work on that. That can bring a lot of relief to the cervical spine. Core stabilization, joint centering, and muscle stabilization as well as neuromuscular repatterning. Pilates exercises, works on breath, improved body awareness and core and joint stabilization. I use TheraBand and hand weights to add some resistance training. The exercise ball is a great tool for strengthening balance and proprioception through the foot, ankle and the hip, supported stretching and again, kinesthetic awareness. And then always wanting to add an element of cardiovascular training, walking, recumb recumbent cycling and the pool being good choices. And so now Rachel's here demonstrating a few of the exercises, um, again, that she does. Um, she's got a large variety of exercises at her fingertips, so depending on what's going on with her uh, at any given point, we just try to focus on, you know, half a dozen exercises that she can do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the picture on the left shows um, a basic core stabilization exercise, incorporating the adductors, pelvic floor, and transverse abdominis, as well as using the hand weights in order to engage scapular stabilization. The picture on the right shows how you can progress that by adding some resistance with the TheraBand. This exercise helps to improve um, then the strength around the shoulder, improving shoulder stabilization. And then here is some hip work. The picture on the left, the exercise is called the clam, working the glute medius. And then the picture on the right is progression off of that. So always just trying to work within the abilities of the person at that time to give them a few tools based on how they're doing that day. Here, this is um, an exercise uh, that helps to strengthen the shoulder girdle. I like this position with the head or forehead on the towel. It helps to engage the deep neck flexors. So strengthening the neck just by being in that position and then a progression with raising the head and shoulders off the mat to improve strengthening through the arms and shoulders. Um, on the left is now just another progression of that same exercise, adding in some pelvic stabilization and working through the hamstrings and the legs. And then a great exercise on the right, the bridge, which improves pelvic and spinal strength and stability. So a large part of what I do is educate and help the patient problem solve. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you're hitting obstacles in all varieties and areas of um, what you're doing. So looking at activities of daily living, discussing um, how to take breaks within the day-to-day -day activities, um, how much exercise to do, activity, how to again recognize signs, doing things in small chunks if possible, 
balancing their school work schedule, uh, discussing options in terms of how to lift, carry things, even eating with respects to TMJ issues. Sleep positions, that's always a big one. I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of pillows on your beds and uh, tried out a lot. So again, there's no right or wrong. It's about trying to problem solve based on what you're experiencing um, at any given time. So I try to give some suggestions, tools, different types of neck rolls. Um, school work ergonomics, again, chair, desk, computer, and sitting positions. Splints and supports when indicated for the ankles, wrists cervical spine and lumbar spine. So from my point of view, an ideal program would be to see patients weekly or bi-weekly for an hour for a combination of both manual therapy and exercise. Um, begin treatment early. I think that's the biggest thing, is to be able to identify these patients early on before things become um, difficult to manage in terms of both the pain and some of the autonomic symptoms. So you're wanting to maintain function, build strength, and prevent the deconditioning and injuries, because this can go a long way, for sure. Some of the obstacles to treatment. Uh, financial is probably one of the biggest ones. My services are not covered under OHIP, so unless somebody has extended health benefits, they have to pay out of pocket. There are obviously issues with time and location, because I'm only one person, I don't have a team based on how much time I have available and then coming to see me on a regular basis. Treatment outcomes that I'm hoping for is independence. You want to be able to have the tools that you can self-manage some of the everyday problems surrounding sleep, uh, school, diet, lifestyle. Decreased reliance on medications when possible and delay surgical intervention. Improved bo mon mind body awareness, able to listen to their body and recognize those early signs so that you prevent small problems from becoming really big ones. And to educate and empower the patient so that they can use their abilities. Sometimes we get focused on what's not working and what's going wrong, but I find the best way to, um, you know, to access treatment is really to find out what's working well. And if you isolate what's working well, you can use those strengths to help uh, support the other areas. So injury prevention, improved strength, function, and biomechanics are some of those outcomes. And I want to finish with a quote. This is from Christian Fossum. He's a DO from Norway. And I love this quote because it really um, encapsulates how I hope to approach each patient. Our role is to empower the functional physiological and psychological capacities of the patient, characterized by the ability of the individual to adapt to internal and external stress, fostering equilibrium and resilience. And there's Karen and Natalie one more time. Thank you.